In each valley, beyond each range of hills, and spread across its fertile plains are the stories of its people's efforts and achievements. No history book can contain them all, and they either remain or are forgotten as each community is conscious of its ancestral heritage. Kentucky became a state on June 1st, 1792, with Isaac Shelby, the first governor. To the first three original counties of Lincoln, Jefferson, and Fayette, 15 counties were added. Logan County was created from Lincoln County September 1st, 1792. 28 counties have since been created from Logan County. The boundaries ran from Elizabethtown to the Mississippi River. The county was named for old General Benjamin Logan, a Revolutionary War soldier. When Finley Stewart, Philip Austin, Richard Malden, and I came to Logan County, game was abundant with droves of deer and elk Buffalo, why you could kill enough meat to do a regiment for a week in just one day. There were a goodly number of bears, and the nature of the country was wild and romantic and rich. You could see knob after knob, and the barrens were covered with a fine and green growth of grass and cane. Early pioneers were trappers and hunters who killed for the value of the furs of otter and buffalo. The buffalo were so numerous that though on horseback, Colonel Isaac Bledsoe was fearful of being run over and trampled to death by the buffalo. Henderson and company purchased the land of Logan from the Cherokees in 1775. Many Indian mounds are found around Chaco, for this seems to be a favorite spot of the red man. Arrowheads can still be found, and an Indian bathtub can still be seen that was used for the red man for bathing. When a tree was cut, Grown up in the heart of the tree was an Indian tomahawk. Near Lake Malone is Shawnee Indian hunting trail that leads to cave shelters and an ice age rock formation. When the Revolutionary War was over, the United States was broke, so many of the soldiers were given land in the West, which was Logan County, Kentucky, as payment for their services. This is how many of the members of the George Washington family came to settle in Logan County, Fairfax Hall is on the land that was given to Fairfax, Washington. Thousands of disputes arose over boundary lines and hundreds of lawyers moved in to settle them. And with these men began a tradition of law and public service that survives in Logan County even today. In the early days, there was only one lawyer, Mr. William Reading, in 1793. But in 1794, another lawyer made his appearance, and he was no less than Andrew Jackson, the hero of New Orleans. For payment of his services in the Revolutionary War, Robert Baylor was given land and built Flint Ridge, which is the oldest and most original home still standing in Logan County. The original house was built about 1805 and the smokehouse in 1809. A wing was added later, but after the earthquake of 1811, which caused the formation of Realfoot Lake, it was thought prudent not to make the wing two stories high. The McCuddy family has occupied this house since 1829. One of the prettiest places in Logan County is a water mill where farmers went to grind their corn into meal. It was built by Christian Orndorff in the midst of one of the finest tobacco regions in the United States. Sly is still a playground for the young and old. The land in Logan is what is known as Pembroke soil and contains some of the richest farmland in Kentucky. There is more class one soil in Logan County today than in any other county in the bluegrass. Corn grows taller there than anywhere, but tobacco was and still is the staple of the economy. Logan has two distinctive geographic halves. The northern area, the, which is called the Coon Range, is hilly and rocky, and the southern part is flat and fertile. So when the military men were given their land grants, they chose the southern half and grabbed that rich, flat land, started plantations, and brought in slaves to work for them. No chronicle of Logan County's early days would be complete without some reference to the Ewings. The original family members who came from Virginia should always be remembered for taking the lead in bringing law and order to Logan County. The Ewing home represents the lifestyle of the early years of the pioneers with the double log house being built first in 1788, then later used as living quarters for the house slaves. 
Several years later, the Ewings built in front of this log house a brick Italian style home. A brick barn, which was unusual for this area, was also built at this time. The Ewings were farmers and lawyers who served as magistrates, state senators, House of Representative members, and one Ewing family member served also as Associate Justice of the First Circuit Court. The Ewings played a large part in the educational beginnings in Logan County with the chartering of Newton Academy in Russellville in 1798, which was for many years the most important educational institution in Western Kentucky. An even more influential school, Bethel College, was established in Russellville thanks to the generosity of the Ewing family. The majority of the Bethel College endowment was awarded from Ewing Wealth. Education was important for many of the families like the Ewings who came from Virginia and North Carolina where learning was valued and desired to provide teachers for their children. Many of the early teachers were also preachers like James McGreedy, Valentine Cook, and Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright described Logan County as a rogues harbor for even after Logan County was well settled people came from Tennessee to gamble, duel, drink and fight. It is said that many an early pioneer was never seen again after stopping at Drum Ghoul's Tavern in Kilgore Station, which is now known as a Adairville. You must be remembered that Logan County was really a part of the Wild West. The people of Nashville gave some evidences of religion, but in Logan County, the people were hardened in sin and inclined to the world, and many of them were vile outlaws. The times were right for the Second Awakening, which began in June of 1800 under the leadership of James McGreedy on the banks of the Red River. The Red River Church was the first and oldest church in southern Kentucky, and it is where the great revival of 1800 was held. It was the greatest religious movement in the history of our nation. People came for a sacramental meeting from even North Carolina, and having no place to stay, they camped in their wagons for a number of days and nights. The camp meeting was a unique feature of church life in America, and Logan County was the birthplace of the camp meeting. Even Andrew Jackson attended worship services at the Red River Church. The revival progressed from Red River to Gasper River near Woodville, which was to become Auburn, to the banks of Muddy River near Boiling Springs, which was the early name of Russellville. John Rankin was a preacher who settled on the Gasper River and took part in the revival and was to take an honorable place of leadership with the Shaker Colony in 1807. Shaker buildings include a tavern which guests of national prominence were entertained while passing through the village. An entry in the journal read, President Monroe and a party and General Jackson and family dined here today. The Honorable Henry Clay, John J. Crittenden, and others took dinner at our tavern today. While the Shakers were settling in the east, Major Bibb was freeing his slaves in Russellville. In the yard of his home, Major Bibb, with his Bible in his hand, pronounced a divine blessing and then liberated his slaves by giving them passage to Liberia. Shortly after Russellville was established as a town by the first court, a racetrack was laid out. This is where Andrew Jackson and others came to gain and lose money racing their horses. Looking out over the fertile fields, you can see a tavern where General Jackson stayed the night before the duel. He was to be ferried across the river the next morning, but the ferryman never showed, so they forded on horseback. Jacob Smith was in the area the day of the duel. Let's ask him if he saw anything. Well, now we was down there working in the bottom that day, and I heard the splash, you know, in the river, and the horses come across there. And they went on up there, and about a half hour later, I heard two pistol shots, and it's pretty close together. Well, now after that, Jackson and his bunch came back, and they stopped down there at the creek for water. And old Jackson, I'll never forget this, old Jackson called for buttermilk. of being one of the best shots in the West. 
Curiously, comments made by Dickinson on his way to the duel scene the day before may very well have saved Jackson's life. Dickinson missed no opportunity on his journey to Kentucky to display his marksmanship, hoping to unnerve Jackson. On the road to Kentucky, he made many fancy shots demonstrating his skill with the pistol. In one instance, cutting a string at 24 paces, remarking, show that to General Jackson when he comes by, and tell him I'm going to shoot that bright brass button off that is over his heart. Overton, on hearing this, gave wise counsel to Jackson. Unbutton your coat, General. That'll put your heart three inches away. I'll wait. I swear to you, I'll wait. Our advantage comes in you taking precise and accurate aim. That means that Dickinson must shoot first. It matters not. Even if he puts a bullet in my brain, I'll still kill him. The seconds conferred and agreed upon the time and place of meeting, and the agreement was in writing as follows. On Friday the 30th, we agreed to meet at Harrison's Mill on Red River in Logan County, state of Kentucky, for the purpose of settling an affair of honor between General Andrew Jackson and Charles Dickinson. It is understood that the meeting will be at the hour of 7 in the morning. It is agreed that the distance shall be 24 feet. The parties to stand facing, each with his pistol down perpendicularly. When they are ready, the single word fire to be given, at which they are to fire as soon as they please. Should either fire before the word is given, we pledge ourselves to shoot him down instantly. The person to give the word to be determined by lot is also the choice of position. We mutually agree that the above regulation shall be observed in the affair of honor pending between General Andrew Jackson and Charles Dickinson Esquire. These stipulations were signed by the seconds on Saturday, May 24, 1806. General, you think that's a little far for you? <laughs> Well, it don't matter either what it'll do. and did step back to the mark, his eyes avoiding the steely gaze of Jackson, who calmly raised his pistol and with careful and deliberate aim pulled the trigger. Although the weapons which belonged to Jackson and of which Dickinson had had first pick were expensive and precision made English pistols, the pistol failed to fire. Instead, it snapped and stopped on the half cock. According to the account of the duel written by the late John Trotwood Moore, Coolly, grimly, deliberately, he recocked his pistol, and when he aimed again, he took no chances, for he aimed not at Dickinson's head, nor at his heart, but at his stomach, for he knew if the great ball sped through, there was no surgeon of the day who could save his opponent. Dickinson was in agony from the moment he was shot until about 9 p.m. that night when he rose up in bed and cried, Why? Why have you put out the light? Jackson's wound was more serious than he had indicated. 
The ball shattered two ribs and plowed through Jackson's side and into his back. His wound never properly healed and troubled him until his death. At the time of the duel, Dickinson was 25 and Jackson was approaching 40. Had Jackson been the one to die in 1806, American history would have been considerably altered. Uncle Jimmy Rice, another eyewitness of the duel, said that after he had heard the two pistol shots, Jackson and his party reappeared at the spring and they asked for water. But Andrew Jackson called out for buttermilk. Uh, has the milk gone to butter yet? Harrison Mill, where Dickinson died, was the site of one of the first court meetings. It was ordered that where the Logan County Courthouse now stands that a town by the name of Russellville be established. Russellville was known as Big Boiling Springs in 1790. It was a crossroad, and by 1800 you could forget you were in the wilds of Kentucky. Russellville was the third largest town in the state, next only to Louisville and Lexington. It was the third most important business town, too, in the state, supplying the commercial needs of southern Kentucky and a considerable portion of Tennessee. Logan County spawned Kentucky governors, six governors of other states, five U.S. senators, six congressmen, three Kentucky chief justices, three U.S. ambassadors, three federal cabinet officers, and four men who went west and died at the Alamo, including the legendary Jim Bowie, called Logan County home. Logan County had so much to offer. In fact, it's almost as if all of Kentucky had been compressed into that county. Why, you could say that Logan County is a sample of what's best about Kentucky. But it's also true that Logan County was once a wilderness, a wild and savage country. But civilization and progress had arrived. We'd cleared the land, made farms in the dark, rich sod. Villages and towns sprang up, schools were built, and the churches brought a conscience to this savage land. Logan County is different because of its age and the men of family and culture who founded and shaped it. The quality and fertility of the land had something to do with it. When the settlers came here, they found it a pleasant place to live and an easy place to make a living. There was time left over for culture. Logan is proud of her heritage, her forebearers, and cherishes her southern culture and speech. She regards her fertile soil and welcomes her budding industries with eyes fixed on the future. But there is a distant rumble of cannons that can be heard. The war years are coming, and Logan will become a mere miniature of the nation. The south end will be southern, and the northern end will remain loyal to the Union. We are in Dixieland. 